Welcome to Comic Book Herald's Cree Annotators. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of Comic Book Herald. I'll be interviewing some of my favorite creators in comics about specific runs, graphic novels, or series, looking for their insights and inspirations behind the work. Today, I'm excited to welcome Steve Orlando, co-author of Kill a Man, a new 2020 graphic novel out from Aftershock Comics. Kill a Man is the story of an MMA fighter on the road to a championship belt when he's outed by a competitor during a press conference. Ultimately, this leads the fighter to turn to the former fighter, who killed his father in the ring, a queer black man himself, for help on his road to return to conquer the sport. Steve, thanks for joining. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. First question I have for you is, Kill Man simultaneously feels familiar as a sports journey kind of story that I think a lot of people will recognize. It's definitely in that Rocky Creed sort of, you know, boxing movie um, like genre, if you will, but it's entirely different given the main characters are queer. And that's not just something that's been a part of the kind of the cultural integration of stories like a Rocky. Can you tell us how the story came to be? Uh, honestly, sort of, uh, you're dead on because it came from my desire, you know, being a bisexual, uh, guy, but also being a comics creator and, and someone who, who loves those films and, uh, and was inspired when he saw Creed that, you know, uh, you sort of could see the, the narrative DNA. You could see the idea in the 70s, you know, Rocky was standing up, you know, he was a symbol for the blue collar worker, the person that didn't go to college, you know, and, and, and was in the struggle. Uh, and, and he sort of said, you know, you can, you can go the distance. He didn't win, you know, the whole thing is he didn't win in that movie. All he did is go the distance. Because in reality, that's all you can do in life. You don't get a belt that solves your problems all we can do is go the distance until of course we don't and that's the way it goes so i think that it's much more powerful in that messaging and then you had that in creed you know um uh, a movie that took that sort of narrative by creators of color uh and, and and gave that to a black lead and i thought that that was incredibly moving now they you know they get a hero that says you can go the distance mm -hmm. they get a hero that says you know you might think that you're going against everyone else you're really just going against yourself and in that fight you you can overcome and you can win so lee i, I mean it's my favorite movie 2015 one of my favorite movies ever um and it was different for me because as much as rocky represented blue collar people he still had you know he's still a bro white dude and it was really different uh to see the uh the extra narratives woven into creed the uh you know i the anger sort of inherent uh at at marginalization and, and at the struggles that we go through, uh, you know, when you're in one of any number of marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And it strengthened the metaphor for me, you know, uh, because it was, you know, there, you, you've been treated unjustly, you want to lash out. Well, here's a narrative that allows you to uh, express that, but in a way that is, uh, is broadly positive uh, and constructive. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And, and I wanted that for, uh, for the LGBT community, you know, we've seen uh, tertiary narratives. You know, you know, uh, Nick Jonas in in the Kingdom, uh, God love him, plays a, a closeted MMA fighter. But I didn't think that the, it, it would give him the showcase that it deserved, and I didn't think it had the interrogation that it demands as well. Because there's one angle when you're talking about communities of color and the way that fiction depicts men of color. Uh, and then you have another aspect that can be picked apart when it comes to combat sports, when it comes to uh, the queer community, and that's masculinity, that's toughness. Mm -hmm. And that's this idea that a lot of what is generally uh, stereotypically associated with being queer is the antithesis of what's uh, associated with being in boxing, in, in mixed martial arts. And of course, that's all bullshit, uh, you know, um, but people, uh, you, you know, that has to be shown to them. That has to be shown that you can be this and that, and you and and you can be uh, anything in between. So it was important for me to uh, to give that type of hero uh, an imperfect but overcoming hero uh, to the LGBT community. We have that in the lead of of uh, of James Belly, but it's not you know that in of itself is not a story because much like any person who is queer in real life, like we're more than just being queer we have any number of other things so right. when i took this opportunity with kill a man it was also about interrogating this idea of violence and looking back at uh emile griffith who's a real life person bisexual boxer in the 60s uh mm -hmm. 
who killed a guy in the ring uh, after being having slurs said to him. And, you know, he's often lionized by people who weren't there, uh, by people in the gay community, the queer community. And I understand that it's a symbol, but when you read his books and his statements, uh, you find that for him, killing someone, you know, was no small thing. It's, it's easy to be like, oh, you called, you know, you called me this slur, I beat you to death. And that's very like rah, rah, because we're so desensitized. But the reality is it, it weighed on him for the rest of his life, right or wrong. It's, it wasn't that simple. And so that's the other thing we wanted to do with this book is really interrogate uh, this, this, this idea of vengeance, this idea of violence, and how it brings people together through this bond, even if it's a toxic bond, that uh, when you're outside, you just can't understand. Uh, so the Emil Griffith character in Kill a Man, Xavier Maine, uh, is, you know, he's married, he's in a long-term relationship, and he loves his husband, but at the same time, his husband can't understand what it was to be in that ring and, and, and kill that person. And so his husband's views on whether or not he should train James Belly are just, they're, they, they can't possibly be informed, uh, and they can't possibly understand. So this is also a story about how these, nuclear acts, you know, something like killing someone, can bond people together with an understanding through trauma that really no one from the outside can understand. You know, Xavier killing Belly's dad is something that is just between the two of them, essentially. Yeah. And it's both the reason you never think they could come together, uh, but once the status quo changes and James is outed at his press conference before his title fight, uh, the world finds out he's gay and suddenly his whole perspective their perspective on each other is irrevocably changed as well. James realizes this man that he hated for so long for killing his dad, well, his dad was probably someone who would never have accepted him anyway. And, and Xavier, who sees James as just the product of this bigot, well, now he's someone who would have potentially been just as a, much of a target for that person as he was. Mm -hmm. So Kill a Man is about giving uh, the queer community this hero, it's about showing people that there's no one way to be a member of the LGBT community. It doesn't forbid you from doing one thing or the other. But it's also about people coming together and overcoming shared trauma and realizing that as much as we like to glorify violence uh, these days, uh, it is a raw, primal, uh, traumatic thing, uh, whether even if you're the one inflicting it in a righteous way. And so, and so we don't want to shy away from that. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of that in those Creed movies too, but we just thought we could push the narrative even further. You know, we like to say it's like those movies, but essentially Kill a Man is Creed if instead of teaming up with Rocky in Creed, he had, uh, Adonis had no choice but to team up with Ivan Drago. Uh, right, sure. and, and, and how could that possibly happen, you know, and that's where our story starts. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, that's a great explanation, definitely. I, I think there's after reading the first several pages of the book, I started Googling the character names, wondering if this was based on real events. So it's really interesting to hear you share, you know, these like these moments and individuals in boxing history that you're sort of drawing from as a as historical basis. Right. For for the story that you're telling, um, wow. which to me is like a testament to the Inspired. fact that it feels lived in. Inspired What's that? by real events. Inspired by real events. Inspired uh, by. That's better. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not actual biography here. Um, it's not, you know, biography, but I'm curious, like, was MMA boxing, was this something that was already a part of your lexicon as a even as a sports fan? Because it wasn't for mine, definitely. Like I've I've grown up sort of that's been on the fringes. I'm aware of its immense popularity, but a lot of times when I do see it, you know, it's more just like the outsized personalities of um, a Conor McGregor or whoever's like, you know, they get the big headlines. Was this something you were super aware of? Or was it just like, this is an arena of extreme masculinity that I think it just fits? Well, I mean, you know, I, I mean, there's always an element of biography, by the way, like in everything. And a lot of what James goes through being in the closet is a lot of the rationalization I went through. Of course, for me, it was like 20 plus years ago. Uh, uh, but his sort of ideals of uh, masculinity and what's positive and negative are certainly things that long ago uh, I struggled with, you know, and yeah, blown up by mixed martial arts, by the way. So it's uh, the, the pressure's not even more. Uh, but being from central New York, which is a pretty conservative area, you know, I certainly had times in my life where I was like, oh, well, I'm not one of those types of, of, of queer people, you know, uh, which uh, was wrong. And I learned that very early on, you know. Honestly, you know, my, my positions on that 
completely inverted. You know, it is ultimately easier to be me, someone who is relatively male presenting and relatively uh, masculine presenting than like Jonathan Van Ness, who, you know, the price of him being true to him or them, excuse me, being true to themselves when they leave the house every day is their safety. And that's much braver, honestly, than being me. So that, uh, you know, I went through that journey over a decade ago, uh, but it's important to show, uh, so, you know, put that to page and show someone going through that in their own life. In relation to mixed martial arts, um, I was already a fan. The reason I brought in Phil Kennedy Johnson, Alec Morgan, is that I am also a huge coward. You know, I wanted the uh, I wanted the aspects of uh, the you know the queer aspects of the book to be as true as possible, and that's those are all things that I've lived and seen. But the mixed martial arts to be taken seriously by that community, and those need to be as accurate as possible too. So I brought my friend Phil in, who I already knew, uh, and he is a great writer in his own right, doing The Last God at at Vertigo slash Black Label and uh, Captain America, uh, Empire Times at Marvel, a whole bunch of. Shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and Alec, who I worked with on Midnighter, I knew also trained mixed martial arts. So I was like, okay, this stuff has to be as accurate as possible. And Phil has brought like a, a wealth of knowledge to the book. So much of the like the way that the, the Dana White character talks is comes from him. So much it's hard to see what's him and me, and that's the great part of the book. But also like it's it's there's a there's a realness on both sides of the story that I think is is really special. So, but I I was a fan like I was always been a pro wrestling fan. Uh, I, I mean, I was out of that for 10 years too, but I came back in 2015 when Sting came back because he was my guy when I was younger because he was just a nice. superhero. Yeah. And I was sort of, uh, I sort of, as I started going to cons and sort of talking to people who do it, I gained a lot of appreciation for the industry and the people, even if Vince McMahon is a piece of shit, uh, the people that do it really love it. And I felt a lot of kinship to comics because, you know, when you're trying to break into comics, uh, you spend your whole life doing something that most people think isn't a real job, uh, but you just have such a passion for it, you have to keep going. And that's what I felt when I first started going to indie wrestling shows and talking to, to, to up-and-coming wrestlers because they're doing something that nobody thinks is is, is a real job. Uh, I'm not going to say nobody thinks it's real, but nobody thinks it's a real job, and, and many people think it's a punchline. And not only are they doing it, uh, but they're doing it, I mean, for even less money than I got when I started a comics. Uh, and the, the passion is so undeniable. And so I, I became embroiled in that, embroiled in that. And that's ultimately how I got into mixed martial arts because once I started liking uh, and caring about wrestlers, I really just started hating Brock Lesnar. Uh, <laughs> like just as a person, because he himself has shit points of view and he looks yeah. irritating to look at. He looks like a thumb that's been struck by lightning. <laughs> and, uh, and so I... Uh, I was at this bizarre true story of my life. This is what Comic Cons do to you. I was at a uh, con in Lake George, New York, and UFC 200 was on it. I never watched UFC, but I knew Brock was going to be on there in a shoot fight, and I would have paid any amount of money just to see him get the f- beaten out of him because I just do not like looking at him and his stupid tattoos. Yeah. So. Uh, we were desperate in Lake George, like, you know, what's open in Lake George late, nothing. It's a, it's the, it's the Reno, Nevada of upstate New York. So like we find this pizza place that's willing to open, go, go open late. We, and actually rig their TV to our computer to watch UFC 200. And again, in a bizarre moment, I ended up watching that with the black Ranger, the original black Ranger, Zach. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Is like super into mixed martial arts and uh, a couple other people, but just the weird things that happen in comics. Uh, Walter Jones, I think is his name. Um, I hate when you call people by their character names, um, meaning me. But uh, anyway, Brock didn't get his ass kicked. But that's the same night that Amanda Nunez became the first ever lesbian champion. Oh, okay. um, and I was just hooked. I was hooked by her, and I kept watching since then. Of course, she made history this weekend, actually, at 2.50. Uh, she had already made history, becoming the first ever women's double champion. Right. Then she became the first person ever, regardless of gender, to defend both titles. There were three dudes that had been double champions, but they lost one of the other, one of the two immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's the first person that's ever defended them. So I've been in since then. I've, and it, essentially, it is the same way I feel about wrestling. Dana White is a cancerous piece of shit. Uh, but the people that do it, it's so pure. Uh, the, the, the competition is so raw that I, I can't help but still support them any way I can. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
you know, and so I, I've, I've been on it since then. And um, as it comes to other sports, honestly, like I either like completely work sports like wrestling or I like UFC. Everything else to me just feels like a pretense to just pure violence. So why don't we just go right to pure violence? Um, <laughs> sure. feel, like, I don't know, like when I watch football, I'm like, why don't, why don't you just actually fight? Like, I just, why are we just, let's just get there. Let's just go. There, you know? so, yeah, it's uh, interesting take. So, you know, so that's kind of how it, but you know, no shade to literally every other sport, but I'm kind of like, let's do it where like, it's all planned. And then otherwise, like if we're just watching NASCAR for the crashes and hockey for the fights, let's just go to the fights. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so, hockey okay. definitely fits that bill as well. Like sure. fighting is, is the primary draw for sure. Yeah. yeah I was struck, like looking into MMA. Cause I, again, like I don't have a ton of familiarity, but I was researching it after reading this, after reading kill a man. And, um, I was struck like, yeah, there's a lot of openly, um, lesbian or queer uh, fighters that have like a ton of success, you know, a man in union is chief among them. Right. And then obviously on the male side, there's less openness to it in, in UFC. Right. So I think that's part of what made kill a man really like stick out to me is, is still this idea of, even though James Bellier, the, the fighter who's, you know, he's outed, right. It's not his own choice. The, the difficulty, the wearing that burden of being, you know, a, a primary figure in a sport that is so centered on, you know, these, these kind of, like you said, these ideas of masculinity that, that RBS, you know, it's like, that would be tremendously difficult. And then if you apply that to all of the bigger sports, right. Larger in terms of size and popularity, basketball, baseball, football, right. This, like, it just almost never happens that an athlete would come out at least not until their career's over. I feel like Michael Sam drafted in the NFL. That was like a huge deal. And then it went nowhere. Yeah. And then, but it's like, and, and clearly that's like, well, let, let there be players who are queer go nowhere. Right. Like that. They don't all have to be superstars. That's fine. Um, anyway, long story short, I was really struck by just like, this seems like a sport where that could and should happen. And it has on the, the female side of things, but really not with any male fighters. Do you think that's just like, do you think it's just that, that masculinity, like, I don't know, that toxic masculinity just soaked into everything that prevents that? Well, yeah, and I think that's also why you see it more accepted for there to be queer women fighters, because, of course, in the eyes of idiots, they're acting more like men. They're acting, you know, mm -hmm. like they're, they're even tougher, which is a load of horse shit. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you can see the, the low brain rationalization, um, yeah. which is, by the way, the same reason that in almost every, you know, mainstream straight male scenario, you know, they, they all love lesbians because they're all yeah. in the end, all fools. Yeah. Uh, um, but, you know, so, so that's what you're seeing there, I think. Um, you know, it's the funny thing about Brock is uh, that there was a rumor going around, and it's just that, you know, people will say anything in reflex. There was a rumor that originally, years and years ago, his character was going to be gay, but otherwise he oh. would just be Brock Lesnar. And the funny thing about that is, like, that's probably the only way like a dude like VKM who has the mind of, of a 15 year old, even though he's 74, uh, could have a heroic gay character. Just like, you know, have him be basically act like a straight guy who just happens to be with men. And, you know, that is, uh, it's, it's just ingrained in the, in the thinking, yeah. right? Like you couldn't have, you couldn't possibly, you know, be, be good at something unless you basically subvert that part of yourself, even in their mindset. So, yeah, I mean, I think it is ingrained. I think in this hyper tough world uh, of mixed martial arts, um, any anything that could be perceived as a weakness, even though we in normal society know it's not, uh, is something that people latch onto. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 blood in the water. It's blood in the water when you read the book. Uh, even though, of course, it, it makes no difference. He's the same person he was the day before he gets outed. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, that is the unfortunate reality uh, of, of, of the world. Um, and, you know, it's funny, like an early review, and, and I am not criticizing the review specifically, but an early review of the book said they didn't think the world presented in it. Uh, they didn't like how unaccepting the world of Killer Man was. <laughs> yeah, right. And it was almost like, oh, I just like, I wish the world wasn't this way. Like, well, I do too. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, this month the Supreme Court's deciding if it's legal or not in America to fire you just for being gay. So, like, 
let's not act like it's a cakewalk. Yeah, right. Uh, so, like, yeah, it would be nice if it wasn't like this, but it is. Uh, so, yeah, no, it definitely stands out. Like everywhere, everywhere James turns after he's outed, he is rejected. I mean, it's friends, it's his mom, which is one of the most heartbreaking, I think, moments in the book. Um, it's absolutely everyone, right? And it's to the point you just made. Like that is a a stark reality for too many people. As as hard it is, just like it should be hard to stomach. I guess is the point, right? Like that. That, that is not supposed to be a heartwarming moment, I don't think by any measure. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the some of the structural choices in the book. Um, I, I was struck a few times noticing parallels like in design between fight scenes and sex scenes, um, often letting the art and it, the coloring in particular really stands out in this book by Alec Morgan. Um, I think he, he's doing the art and the colors on this, yeah, where yeah. there's these they're both action oriented sequences. How much detail do you find yourself providing for scripts like that, um, especially around like the coloring and kind of the tone? Um, or is that more collaborative? I'm sure it's very collaborative. But in terms of scripting, are you like, hey, I want this tonal approach in coloring and in art as we kind of leave the dialogue out of this? Um, on originals, uh, it's I, I honestly um, very little for me. And I think that's how it should be like I, I'm. Doing work for higher stuff like a super matter or Wonder Woman is different, but when we're all in it together on, as a creative team on an original book, and by the way, like even on a book like Martian Manhunter, that I read, we did this the same way. Like part of my job and Phil and my Phil and my jobs, Phil and my own job grammar is uh, to know when to not lean in. We are entering a risk and reward scenario with another equal collaborator. So yeah. on those action scenes and on the sex scenes and on any scene, uh, we script the action and we script the dialogue. And yeah, it's not not allowed for a writer to lean in. We can lean in anywhere. I don't necessarily think we should, and that's the point. To me, when you're on an original, you are choosing collaborators and you're saying, I trust you, I respect you. So it's about, for me, uh, it's about as much what I don't put down as, as I do. Like, if I didn't trust Alec, I wouldn't have asked for him to be on the book. If I didn't trust Jim Campbell on letters, by the way, I, you know, I, I, I would, you know, I wouldn't have asked for him to be on the book. Or in this case, if Phil didn't, I, uh, he wouldn't have asked for him to be in the book. And I have the yeah. utmost respect for Phil, so I said, yeah, let's do it. So the answer is like, I'm super excited that those work for you, but that's the beauty of collaboration to me when you do it right. Like I'm not, we're not telling Alec how to handle those things because he knows, you know, he knows how to do it, and, and yeah. it's important to give your collaborators room. Uh, and, and to me, that's how you get an even better book. Uh, you can make a comic like an assembly line. Sure, it happens all the time, but I don't think that you'll get the best version of that story. So especially at originals, I honestly try to lean back, uh, you know, wh when I can, because that's where other people innovate and that's where other people do their best work. When they feel that you're letting the slack up, when they feel that you trust them and you respect them, they get confident, they get innovative. And, and that's how those sequences come together. Sure. Yeah. No, very cool. That makes a lot of sense. No, I, I think it it doesn't ever feel like anything but a collaboration. You know, I think the, the work is very tight. I, I do find it impressive across the board when there are co-authors on a book, you know, and like you said earlier, the fact that you can't necessarily tell like, oh, this is the the Steve Orlando written bit and this is the Philip Kennedy Johnson written bit is is a testament to, I think, just a good work overall. Um, it, and it definitely in this book, it's not like, oh, they're talking MMA stuff. That must be Philip Kennedy Johnson, right? Like it doesn't have that feel to it. Um, I'm curious across your creator on work. There's... We dialed that back. We dialed that back. Originally it was hyper -technical. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. It was hyper technical and MMA shit. And it was also hyper technical and gay shit. And, uh, you know, and we were both like, well, maybe we didn't, man. You know, so, so we, we, we came to like a Venn diagram. Uh, of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, yeah. you know, I think Phil learned a lot about how two men uh, can interact um, uh, upon reading drafts of the script, but God love him. He took it like a champ. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good. No, it, it definitely, it all feels, yeah, authentic. I guess on the MMA stuff, which was less familiar to me, it was like, oh, like I get this being a part of the language without feeling overwhelmed. Like, well, I don't follow the sport, therefore I'm kind of checked out. Like, that was never really an issue, at least on my read. Um, across your creator on work, there's there's a lot of consistency on theme and tone, but you jump across a wide variety of genres. 
I, I think if I was going to try to describe like expectations of, of a quote unquote Steve Orlando book, it would be like badass queer characters fighting for inner peace ultimately, <laughs> but the setting ranges wildly, right? It's like Jamaica queer exploitation, revenge, extra dimensional sci-fi and namesake um, to now competitive fighting. Why, why do you think you're gravitating towards so many different realms? Is it a, is it just like a creative itch? You're just like, I just gotta, I just gotta hop. Well, I think you're right. I mean, first of all, those are you just, those are all just me. Uh, they're different versions of me, but yeah. like queer and angry and looking for inner peace is probably exactly how my boyfriend describes me too. So. <laughs> uh, you know, Tynan says this all the time. Like he's like, you know, he he says you just write books that are that are re that are that are that are really gay and really violent, and, and I write books that are really <laughs> gay and, and about feelings. And I'm like, yeah. well, that's. Well, all those things are true. You can tell what's a Tynan book and what's an Orlando book because more people get beaten to death in my books. But um, anyway, although that's changing, James's new stuff is like something something is killing the children. It's so many decapitations. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. That's not an easy one. Yeah. And my student, the student has become the teacher. Uh, but um, why do I cross genres? Because it's interesting to me, you know? Um, and and the genre of diversification is only going to continue. I have things coming out uh, with my friend Steve Fox. I, I'm really into co-writing now. Uh, I mean, I'm doing I have more solo originals coming out too. I have a uh, something else I've never done before, which is something inspired by like uh, Gundam and Evangelion and things like that. That's coming out from Project Page uh, whew, from AfterShock. I literally almost just said the name uh, from AfterShock. Um, but I'm doing two books with Fox because in the same way, uh, you know, I bring what I bring to the table, but I'm also not so egotistical to think that I'm great at everything. So in the same way that I wanted Phil to come in and to, mm -hmm. for us to blend our styles to make Killaman the best book possible, I'm doing a YA fantasy with Steve uh, because, again, I have the things that I can I, I deliver and I like to push myself. But I also, uh, you know, I, people shouldn't have to pay for my learning process or any mm -hmm. creative learning process or their dry run or their rough draft. So to make these things the be as best as possible, when I'm stepping into genres that I haven't worked out before, I bring in people that will compliment me to make sure you guys get the best book that you possibly can. So we have a YA book um, that in its own way is still like what you're talking about, although obviously it's YA, so like less dicks and, and less heads exploding. Uh, <laughs> At least on panel, sure, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I also have a horror book. I've never done horror before. <laughs> Uh, but I teased online. We're basically doing like uh, we're doing LGBT horror uh, in 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 the in the style of, of Get Out. It's not the story of Get Out, obviously, because that's very specific to communities of color. Sure. Um, but again, like it's just I'm writing that. I wrote the first ten pages of that today, and it's super exciting to me. Like cause it's just something I've never done before. If anything that, that's happened with this pandemic, as I had said, like it's it's forcing uh, me to push myself. And it means that I'm going to be delivering a ton of really diverse uh, content in the next couple of months, things that I never thought I would do, but it's all incredibly exciting. Like some, I almost feel like I'm glad you mentioned namesake and I love that book, but I almost feel as though like it was maybe a, a little too similar in some ways to like the other originals I was doing at that time. Mm. Uh, and, and that will never be said about the stuff I'm doing right now. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. But I think like, inner, look, at the end of the day, like the reason I keep hopping around is because you don't want to stereotype yourself. You don't want to be Bela Lugosi. Uh, and uh, also like that, those those emotions are universal. And so they can go into almost any uh, any genre. And sure. I, like to, I like to, and the reason that's important to me is to show that it's easy to think that because I'm bisexual and I'm ha and I'm Jewish and I'm all these things that I think this is an experience that is only palatable to those types of folks. But I think that the in the interest is uh, when you realize that even though you may not be exactly like me, uh, the emotions and the core emotions, even if the window dressing is different, are the same as yours. And I think that's how we sort of make bridges and we make understanding. So uh, that's why I. I my themes, you know, there may be an overarching thing I'm writing about, but I like to switch it up. I like to challenge it as much as I can. That's especially kill a man because, you know, half my books are about it's right to just beat someone who <laughs> is mean to you to death. 
Uh, and now we're saying, no, it's anything but. This actually ruins multiple lives. Yeah. Uh, so I like to challenge it, but I like to talk about it because, yeah, like I'm writing for representation, but I'm also writing for the person who's nothing like the, kid, the people in the book and, and picks it up and says, oh, I get it. Uh, and, and maybe I understand that community a little better. Uh, yeah. and, and, and that's, you know, that's so sometimes you learn about things, especially if you're in an area that isn't super diverse. That's how you learn about things. So that's awesome. No, that, that answers a number of questions I had actually, which is like, basically, you know, you were DC exclusive for a while and this year, 2020, right. You're, you're freelance now, I think for the first time in a number of years. Um, it sounds like you're pretty jazzed about it. It sounds like creatively, like you're pretty excited to be jumping into all these different projects. Um, I do want to give you the chance, obviously don't have to spoil anything or share anything you don't want to, but what are the things that are coming out soon that you want people to get excited about that they right, actually, before you even answer that, when, uh, when does kill a man actually come out? We should probably share that. Well, barring the world, uh, cause it was supposed to come out in June and we pushed it back. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is scheduled now, uh, for October. We were going to do it for pride month. We're now doing it for October, which, which is, uh, has national coming out day. Yes. Uh, so we're going to try to center it around whatever the release date is right around that day, which I believe that's October 11th. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, reply in the comments if I got the date wrong. <laughs> we'll look that up. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, but, um, so we're looking at October. Uh, and before that, there is, so there's some cleanup. I mean, I'm not totally done with DC. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just spreading my wings. So there's going to be, uh, I am off Wonder Woman, as you saw, but my story is wrapping up in Wonder Woman Annual 4, uh, a little bit sooner than expected. But at the same time, the annual has ended up, I think, being a nice, really good summation about everything that I think is great about Diana and everything that I was hoping to get to and was important to me. Uh, about the character uh so you know my issues wrap up uh i don't know it's hard for they switched the numbering after i had written them so i like yeah i'm like issue 92 is my final issue but issue 92 doesn't exist anymore yeah, I think I jumped to 750 right I think it's 758 is my final issue yeah uh, beautiful art by emmanuel lupacchino and it's Diana being Diana. I'm so excited for it. And it ends with a moment that I've been, you know, I had been hoping to get in and hoping to build towards a little longer, but still we got there uh, with what's coming for the Amazons of Themyscira. And then when the annual comes out, like there's both a huge uh, reveal at what's coming for the world of Wonder Woman in DC, even though I'm not, even though it's going to be one of my awesome peers uh, that you folks don't even know about doing it. The mm -hmm. first thing of that is, is in Wonder Woman annual. And also, it's just, it is a story that is, if I never write Wonder Woman again, uh, I'm incredibly proud of that annual. It opens with Diana riding a megalodon, having the time of her life. Heck yeah, yeah. And, and it ends with her inspiring women for generations to come. Uh, and, you know, there's 48 pages in between, or 38 pages in between, excuse me. Uh, but... I can't wait for folks to see that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really excited for that to come out. There's some other stuff too. Uh, there's going to be a short uh, in, uh, in one of the summer specials. There's going to be some other digital shorts, some other things. I, I might actually be back doing some Doom Patrol very quickly, very quickly, but something I really like. Um, and man, as originals go, there's so much. However, I don't know when any of it's coming out because of, all these things. So Kill a Man is coming out. You're going to see YA fantasy from me. You're going to see uh, queer horror from me. You're going to see a book that I can only describe as Wonder Woman meets Sailor Moon from me and a publisher I've never worked for before until now. That's probably in the fall, but there's like, I not even announced yet. So um, I'm working with TKO, uh, which I did say I'm working with them when I did my little announcement in January. So that book is going to be hitting probably by the end of the year in phase three. Uh, and again, it looks like no other book I've done. The art is incredible. Uh, anime influenced by Ricardo Lopez Ortiz, uh, mm -hmm. who did uh, Black Panther versus Deadpool, a ton of great books at Marvel. Nice. Um, and is that going to be the bundle approach where it's all all six at once potentially in that TK yeah, model? Yeah, the same format as the other things, but maybe one additional format actually, just because his work has been so stay tuned on that. Mm -hmm. um, but all the ways you can already read TKO, you'll be able to read that. But then there might be one, at least one other thing with it, either immediately or after the initial release. And that book is essentially like 
my sci-fi crisis on infinite earths but mm -hmm. but without without superheroes it's a sci-fi version but the villain is akin to like mageddon from jla world war three or or yeah. the Anthem monitor or things like that uh and i'm and i'm super excited about that plus plenty of dicks so some you know my fans <laughs> like here up Fantastic. Uh, yeah uh, so there's, so as I said, there's a lot going on and I probably even miss stuff. Like I'm doing, uh, I'm going to be launching, uh, a, a free comic strip on Instagram before the end of the year, uh, with a collaborator that I've never worked with before, but I was scheduled to work with somewhere. Uh, and you know, my idea board is actually hidden because I'm always worried. Like it's right there beneath the flex Mentello. Uh, <laughs> all of the, uh, sometimes I do these things and I'm like, do people can they zoom in and see what so like sure there's it's even like that uh it's like that dc 52 board you know like the the booster gold secrets all written up like here's what's coming oh, it's the same yes it's yeah it's and uh so i think oh, man there might be even more too i'm like low-key slowly working on a gay uh passion play that i want to do as like a coffee table graphic novel that uh i hinted at it online but it's uh, it's about sergius and bacchus who a lot of queer religious people worship because they were potentially lovers. Uh, mm. And, you know, they were martyred. Uh, it was Rome, so they weren't martyred for being gay. They were martyred for being Christians. But uh, yeah. uh, but I think, you know, I, I'm always slowly working on that. Um, there's also even some re-releases of old stuff. I'm going everywhere. You know, when I'm stuck at home, I just say yes to a lot of things, and then I work my ass off forever. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds exciting. There's a lot of really, really interesting work in there that I look forward to seeing. Very cool. Uh, final question that I want to toss your way, and then I'll, I'll let you have your time back. You've been very gracious with it, so thank you. Uh, we are recording this during Pride Month, and obviously this is uh, an important month for the queer community. Kill a Man is, is set in this world. It's deliberately queer fiction. As a voice telling these stories, what are your hopes that readers will take away? in their own understanding of like what it is to be queer and kind of these notions of masculinity that we've been talking about um, the whole time. Well, I, I had sort of hit on it, but you know, for, for readers without the community, I, I hope that they learn sort of what I said, that there is, you know, that there's no one way, much like I had said with Midnighter or much like I had showed with Martian Manhunter and, uh, and, and Diane Mead, there's no one way to be, to be, a member of the queer community, regardless of how you identify uh, yeah. with gender and sexuality, uh, that you do does not mean you are, it literally does, does not mean anything else about other character traits. You, it does not mean anything about your quote unquote toughness. It doesn't mean anything about your quote unquote uh, strength. Uh, all of those things are nonsense. They're just things that, you know, you've been sold by, that, that society sells you, but it's, it, it's not the case. Uh, you can, be whatever you want and you can be all those things and be queer. Uh, so, so that's important, you know, um, it's important because it, it breaks down barriers and from inside the community, uh, I hope we, I, I hope we think about, I mean, we have a right to be angry, but I think that, you know, we tend to still, I mean, we're still Americans. We still glorify violence. And I think that we always want to think about where and when we deploy it what it means uh, you know that's a lot about what the xavier main slash Emil griffith character is about and as well i think we need to be uh open uh to understanding that everybody's journey is different within the community you know you don't um, automatically come out of the closet and lose all the other socialization that you've had for your whole life so yeah years ago uh you know i had my own assumptions about masculinity that I broke because I'm not a, a weak-minded fool, but it, I had to break them. I had to I had to reevaluate uh, what I thought about these things, and and so I hope that you know I, I, James Bailey is deliberately imperfect. He's deliberately fallible with a long road to go to accepting himself, and that you know he can be all these things, and that it doesn't make him lesser. Uh, and you know, there's a place for utopian fiction. Uh, where characters don't struggle with these things and, and, and everything is automatically fine. Um, that's not me. There's other people that do that great. And so, so for this, I hope that people are patient with him. And, and then they look at that and they're patient within, with other queer people in their community in their own life. Because even though we're, all, we're in it, we're not all in the same place. We don't all have the same experience. And a lot of us, myself included, I'm not perfect, still have a lot of learning to do. Uh, and it's on us 
to be open to that and to listening. Uh, but we have to be in spaces where we can learn and, and people have to bear with us. So, uh, you know, I went through that a lot. I will, there will never be a point in my life where I say that I don't have to keep learning because there's always someone else that's not like you. Um, but that's an important part as well. Like we have to take pride in who we are. Uh, we also have to evaluate who we are. I think especially now, uh, yes, it's pride month, but I, it's ignorant to say that there's not massive social upheaval going on in the world. Uh, things like black lives matter. I'm only doing donations to, uh, BLM and other protests and police brutality related charities for pride month. I'm not yeah. talking about myself otherwise. Uh, and, and so just as those, this character goes through his own self interrogation, you know, look, we as a community have to do that too. Um, you know, we have to look at things that we thought were, I mean, th that parts of the community would do, uh, and, and we have to make them unacceptable. You know, you, we would try to dunk on people, you know, on, on apps like Grindr. They would, you know, your profile, no blacks, no fats, no Asians. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's very commonplace, but that you can't just dunk on those people. That has to be unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, we have to do better as a community because we want people to be better uh, and treat us better, but we have to improve as well. I don't think that uh, it's, it's, it's acceptable to just look at our struggle and not realize that it is not the same, but it's adjacent and in parallel to a lot of others. And so that's how I'm handling pride. That's how I hope a lot of people are because, you know, equality for us is great, but it's really jack shit until everyone has it. So that's important to me. And I hope, and look, plenty, <laughs> there's, there's in, in, countless great people within the community, but not hundred percent. And we'll never reach 100%, but we have to constantly be pushing. We have to constantly look at ourselves and see how we could be better and how we can be better to other marginalized communities. Because, you know, I, I, I try not to be too, I don't know, down about things. But, you know, there's that moment. Uh, I think right now we're, you know, there's a moment in All-Star Superman where Lex Luthor gets Superman's powers. Uh, and he, he just stops. He's like, Oh my God, this is how he sees the world every day. And it's just us. Mm -hmm. We're all in it together. Uh, and he starts crying and he doesn't see the point of being evil anymore. Uh, well, the reality, I think if anything, 2020 has shown us that, uh, that realization would be lost on some folks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they know that it's just us and they don't give a f so for the people that it's not lost on, we have to work even harder to show compassion, to show strength and show caring, not just for our own community, but for all marginalized communities, because in that respect, we are all in it together. Mm -hmm. And our fight doesn't mean shit unless we're helping other people. So I hope you, I mean, I hope you get that and you, you learn, you, you see compassion in the book, but if you're listening to this, that's how I feel. It's Pride Month, so I'm not gonna give a fuck I'm saying it to. So. Very good, very good. <laughs> well said. All right. With that said, let's end things. Uh, thanks so much, Steve, for your time. I really appreciate it. Again, Kill a Man will be out uh, in October. We'll get the official date in the show notes and everything um, and links as well where they're available. Uh, so thanks so much, Steve.